again for another Australian Football Services podcast. My name is Anil and I'm the Operations Manager of Australian Football Services. I'm joined today by Omar, the Co-Director of Australian Football Services, and also Des Buckingham, who's recently appointed Melbourne City Assistant Coach. Des, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on our podcast and thank you very much for your time. No, a pleasure to, to be here and uh, finally meet you after the message exchange we had in my two-week lockdown period. So nice to put a face to my name. Okay. Um, Des, for, for those who might not be familiar with yourself, uh, could you give us a bit of your background in uh, football and your history in football, please? Yeah, so I'm, I'm only 35, um, but I've, I've been coaching now for 17 years. Um, so that started off as an 18-year-old. Uh, I spent 10 years at Oxford United uh, in the English Football League back in England. Um, and that was in, initially working in the academy space. And that progressed through a 10-year journey of... Um, yeah, working as a youth team coach, 16s, 17s and 18s head coach, um, then become head of coaching and then ended up as a first team coach uh, under Chris Wilder uh, at Oxford before I left and headed over to New Zealand and, and took a role up in New Zealand. Um, that seen me take on a role at the Wellington Phoenix in the A-League, uh, two years as an assistant and then two thirds, I suppose, of a uh, a season uh, once Ernie Merrick resigned and stepped away. Um, so I was head coach of the Wellington Phoenix for two thirds of that season. Left Wellington, went back to Stoke, uh, Stoke City when they were in the Premier League at the time and, and took on a role with their reserve team, as uh, so the under 23s team, before making my way back out to New Zealand uh, a year after. Uh, and that was to take up a role as the head coach for the under 20s um, and an assistant role with the seniors team and then developed into a head coach role with the under 23 Olympic team as well and that comes to a close during COVID and I now find myself in Melbourne at Melbourne City like you've already mentioned um, so that's kind of the coaching side of things and then on top of that I've, I'm a coach educator for UEFA and uh, the lead a licensed tutor for um, Oceania as well so yeah hopefully a, a good enough summary for you in a short space. That's a fantastic history really and um yeah, always good to see young coaches. I, th I believe you you were the youngest ever A-League coach for a, a period of time. Was that right? Yeah, I think that's still the case. So I was uh, 31 at the time uh, in my time of being the coach of the Phoenix. So yeah, four years ago. Um, yeah, it's, it's an uh, excellent master, really. No, that should be definitely impressive on the rest of me, that's for sure. 100%. Awesome. Yeah, well, you look like, uh, sounds like you've got Quite a bit of experience for a 35 year old um that that's for sure there's um in your experience um how does coaching uh, players in england compare to coaching players in nz in australia oh, it's not too dissimilar i haven't found it to be too, too too dissimilar you know i've coached now juniors youth and seniors for decent periods of time and and i've done the same across those three different uh, environments I haven't found too much. The one thing I would say in England in particular, uh, there's exposure to football from a very young age. Um, whereas I think in New Zealand and certainly Australia, there's a lot more sports available to pick for people to do from a young age. Whereas in England, you, you very much, it's football or it's football, you know, and you go to school and before school and at lunchtime and after school, um, you play football. So it's yeah. um, probably a bit more ingrained into, into that sort of sporting culture, I would say, to an extent. Um, and then probably just the length of the season and the amount of games that come with that. And then, of course, the trainers that saddle alongside that. So more opportunities maybe to work with those players over a longer period of time. But in terms of coaching, I found it very similar. I think it's more how you work with players. And that, for me, doesn't matter whether you're in England or New Zealand or Australia. It's about working with people um, and trying to make them better people and players. So, yeah, not too dissimilar. Nice. Excellent. Um, Des, you worked with the uh, the junior All Whites and also the Ollie Whites for collectively for about two years. Um, do you feel like you've achieved the goals that you wanted to achieve uh, when you took charge at that level? And also, what can you tell us about the experience of coaching um, such a representative side? Yeah, um, probably start with that last question. Uh, obviously, totally different. My my 15, 14 years prior to taking on the national team roles was always club based. So I was very used to day to day dealings with players, staff, boards. Uh, whereas, of course, on the international stage, we don't get together very often. And when we do, it's for a very short period of time. Uh, so it was maybe learning how to to deal with um, a whole different raft of people and how to communicate out with those people. And then also making 
best use of every minute of every day that we were in camp with those players because time was uh, so important to us. So that would be probably the biggest thing. But in terms of did we did I, did I achieve or I'll go back to did we achieve because it was greater greater than myself. I think we did. Uh, I think we did more more than that. I mean, when I come in, we were a team uh, that was always out possessed, out passed, out shot, and out scored uh, on the world stage. We spent two and a half years building a playing style, a different type of playing style, and a, and a culture um, that changed. But first, the mindset of the players, um, but also the um, yeah, what was seen on that world stage. And it put a platform, and that was first evident at the Under Twenties World Cup that was last year in Poland, where we showed that players from this side of the world, and in particular New Zealand, can not only go and compete, but can go and win on the world stage and win playing a style of football that was hugely pleasing on the eye, and allowed them a uh, a platform to showcase their own skill sets within that. So that was that was key. Um, I think I don't, anyone that watched the under-23 side when we come across to Australia at the back end of last year and played the under-23s over here, we had two games. Uh, that continued, so we were able to continue the 20s into the 23s. And um, yeah, we were actually disappointed to come away from two Australia games with two draws as we managed to get in the end. Uh, so it was only the, I think it was only two times prior to that ever that the under-23s had ever taken results. So the result was pleasing, but it was more the performance. And then we obviously qualified for the Olympics uh, post that as well. So, you know, looking back, the team, whether it be 20s to 23s, are now a team that consistently outpossess, outpass, outshoot, and outscore teams. Uh, we've got far more players playing professionally uh, than we did have when I arrived. And overall, we played 23 games. We lost once. The under 23s were actually unbeaten at the moment, uh, leading into Tokyo. Well, and then we had lots of other successes around the highest ever finish at the 20s World Cup. We won the Pacific Games gold, which was the first time ever. And uh, yeah, qualified for, for Tokyo 2020, uh, which is now Tokyo 2021. <laughs> Excellent achievement all round. Yeah, yeah, 100% for sure. Uh, Des, what is your assessment of the 2020 A-League season? <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, I think it depends which which side of COVID you you try and answer that question. Um, Both. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I think it's difficult because it was it was very clearly broken into two parts. Mm. You know, not yeah. just the A League, but every every league around the world by the looks of things. And yeah. um, there was teams that headed into that that initial break that were really flying and on form. Uh, and I can use the Phoenix as that example. You know, they they were they took four or five games to get going and start the season. But once they did, um, they're playing some really attractive football and actually, you know, slowly moving their way up the league. And, you know, Sydney continued to do what Sydney do and, and Melbourne City were always there and thereabouts. And then post-lockdown, you know, there's obviously a lot of changes, not just within the league, but there's players, there's a lot of players missing uh, for various reasons. Um, there was managerial differences. So there was a lot of manager, managerial change. Uh, and, you know, being away from what you're used to, whether you're from Perth or you're from Adelaide, and especially if I go back to the, the Phoenix, having to base yourself on a hub model and be away from families and friends for a sustained period of time, I think played a huge impact on, on the way that season ended up finishing. And, um, you know, it took Sydney a while to get going again, but they come good as they always do. And, um, again, the Phoenix kind of started, uh, which, you know, considering everything that they had to go through was... was um, to be not to be expected, but you could understand. Mm -hmm. And I think we ended up seeing the two best teams in the league playing that final. Um, yeah. And that's probably the, the, the thing that I take from that was the two best teams in the league did end up playing and getting to the grand final at the end. So mm -hmm. yeah, difficult one to answer, but um, but interesting to see if COVID hadn't have hit how the season may have showed up. Yeah, sure. Uh, Des, in terms of your qualifications, uh, what kind of coaching qualifications do you hold at the moment? And in your opinion, how important is it for coaches to continue their education long term? Yeah, so I've got my pro license at the moment. Uh, so I, I've done my pro license through Asia and I, I've done my UEFA A license, uh, sorry, I've done my A license with UEFA prior to moving out this side of the world. So yeah, it's pro license here. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've one thing I've found with whether it be going on coach education or now delivering it from the other side, it's Coach education doesn't necessarily make, or qualification doesn't make you a good coach. What it does do is hopefully helps put some processes in place that 
highlight ways that you can work and maybe work in better ways. And then I think it comes down to a whole raft of things. I think it's experience. And of course, to get experience, you generally need qualifications. So they kind of come hand in hand. And then it's about getting out and learning because people know now more than they ever have done. And there's so much more resource available to people to know more and know more about you, whether it be as a team or as a coach, that the more you can learn, um, hopefully the better you can firstly impact the players you work with and, and hopefully be successful with the teams you work. So, yeah, I think qualifications are, are important because they help put a framework around how you do what you do uh, rather than be a robot. And uh, the second thing, I think the, as much learning as you can and, and whether it be a mentor or getting around and engaging with people, this type of thing, that's probably the biggest thing I've taken from COVID is the amount of people that are willing to share both knowledge and what they do that maybe we wouldn't have had access to before. So they'd probably be the two things. Wonderful. You're definitely on the right track there. There's, um, you know, your, your results say it all. Um, yeah, in, just in regards to your coaching, how would you describe your coaching style? Uh, are you a hands-on type of coach or do you regularly, uh, you know, work with your assistant coaches? Yeah, I, I thought about this. Um, I think it's, it's interesting because I think you get an honest answer from the players and the people that <laughs> work with you. You, might, you like to think it would be... We like to think it would be the same. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's one thing, that, if anything, over the last five or six years in particular, actually trying to understand who I am as a coach because I think football is quite traditional in its approach to the way we work, uh, more so than other sports. And what I mean by that is, again, I can say being a young coach at 28, 29, coming to a senior environment as it was at the time, I think I acted and, and behaved and coached in a way that I thought was expected of me rather than actually be my true self yep. um, and actually the last six to seven years I've been able to actually find out who I am and what I'm about and that's come through experience that's come through um, being comfortable oh sorry not being comfortable being uncomfortable being comfortable yep. you know so all those things so yeah hopefully that allows you to have a level of consistency across your work so if, if you were to ask the players or the people I've worked with they hopefully give you the same answers that I'll give you which for me, uh, firstly, I'd, I'd like to think I've got a very collaborative approach. Yeah. And I think it's, now, it's so important now that you get people to work with you, not for you. 100%. Um, yeah. So as a, as a head coach, I think it's important. Of course, you have to set the direction. Yeah. But I think if you can involve people on that journey, and I go back to what I said, people know now more than they ever have done. And that's not just support staff. That's players. Players have great experiences and if they can help add and contribute to the environment and the direction that you are going together, why wouldn't you use that? So that's probably the first style. Um, and then I think it comes down to, regardless of what you know, uh, it's how you relate what you know to the people you work with, whether it's players or staff. Mm -hmm. Because you can know as much as you want to know about whatever it is, but if you can't um, transfer what you know to the people you work with, the message either doesn't get through or it gets lost in translation. So yeah. that's probably the second the thing. And the third would be to actually then utilize, I'd like to think I utilize the skill set of my staff and the players, and the players as I've said, because um, I, I can't be the best coach at everything that we do. Uh, we have assistant coaches, we have sports scientists and analy analysis in some environments. Mm. And if they are better at delivering, whether it be an on-field session or a presentation, they should deliver that. Um, you know, they're employed and they're part of you know, an overall staffing group that gives you a wider coverage of hopefully um, greater knowledge. So then allow them to do their jobs and trust them to do their jobs. And as long as they go back to everyone's kind of working towards the same direction, not only does it allow them to grow, but it allows the environment to hopefully have far more resource and greater shared knowledge that people can draw from. from. So yeah, they'd probably be the three things in terms of I'd like to think my coaching style and if you were to come into my environment would look like. Well, you know what, there's just listening to you there. Um, I think that's the reason for why you're probably so successful at a young age is the fact that you're, you're open-minded, uh, you know, you're willing to take input from, from the people around you, uh, the players, and without a doubt, you know, you're, you're doing the right thing and, and you're on the right track and, you know, I have no doubt that you, you know, you'll be one of the most successful coaches, especially in, in A-League. No, thank you. I just go back to you, but you can't know everything. You simply can't. Yeah. You know, others, others are always going to know more than you, regardless of yeah. what topic or what it may be. And 
for me, that can't scare that can't scare you. I think that's that's great. I think it's again. I go back to being a head coach instead of an assistant at the moment. Yeah. Um, I think it's then the skill set of the head coach to recognise that and see how it best fits to enhance everybody. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's probably been the uh, yeah the main thing for me over the last couple of years in particular. Nice, absolutely. Um, Des, in terms of uh, as a coach. Uh, a lot of people do argue that the connection between A-League clubs and, you know, the local MPL clubs has not been particularly good in the last few years, particularly with um, a lot of younger players from the MPL not really getting a chance to step up to the A-League. What are your thoughts on, on this sort of assessment of that relationship? And also yourself, do you follow uh, the MPL leagues? Yeah, I, I do. And, and it's very similar kind of set up to what we had in New Zealand, uh, where there's a franchise model uh, in New Zealand rather than the club based model that's here. And um, when I look at the players that I've worked with or helped to recruit, um, we I've actually helped to recruit and coach players from the NPR in my time at the Phoenix. So we come across and Jacob Trapp, we took from Sydney United, um, Adam Parkhouse, we took from Manly, uh, Blake Powell, we took from, um, from Appia. Uh, like us so you know we've um, I think all three of those players in particular from that level have not only been able to come in and, and be part of the squad but they've formed some good minutes and appearances and contributed towards the team's success so I've no doubt that the level is um, they're able to make that step up so again I'm getting my head around uh, the this I see it's difficult in Melbourne in particular at the moment with no NPL but um, I think it's really important that clubs engage with their, especially their local uh, local teams because I don't think it's just about players making a step up but I think it's about creating those connections so with the community you know because those clubs represent the community um, and then it's the ability to engage with players in their own environments and also engage and create those relationships and links with the local coaches because you want again ideally within if I'm going to say Melbourne you want people to uh, you want to understand what clubs are trying to do and hopefully help add value to, to them uh, and see players in their own environment maybe where they're a bit more comfortable um, but then there's also the other the other side where if you can share what you're trying to do at your club um, with them and there's opportunities for them to come in and observe what you do it's kind of a two-way street where there's a win-win for both so i think the local connection with local clubs is so key for firstly the community secondly the players and thirdly to to help create a greater sort of connection and scouting network i suppose from what is a league at the moment into Olympia. yeah for sure uh there's you probably heard about this uh the second b league uh rumor <laughs> what's your, what's your thoughts on that yeah i, I think it's interesting first we need to I, I, I don't doubt there is a need for a, a second league or a professional league. Um, how that is structured and what that looks like, again, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I think we need to get the A-League, um, some security around the A-League and what that looks like. But again, that's way above what I'm doing at the moment. Mm. Um, but it would be good to have a, a second league and a B-League because then you can, you can look at promotion and relegation. You can start to look at more opportunities for players, like we've said, to, to become professional players and enhance their own careers. Uh, and, and again, challenge, challenge teams and challenge players from either above or uh, worried about dropping down. So I've seen there is a 30 team sort of list that's starting to work towards that for 2021, 20, 2022. Um, so I'll be interested to keep an eye on that. For sure. Um, now, in terms of uh, your future goals, Yes. Um, do you have any ambitions of coaching in Europe one day? Um, yeah, I mean, I've already I've come from Europe to coach over here. So it's, um, oh, in terms you know, of um, like, uh, let's say in the Premier League. Uh, I think anybody. Well, I can't speak for anybody. I speak for me. I, I want to coach at the highest level I possibly can. Yeah. Uh, and I think the way you can can try to do that, and that's I think when I've been fortunate in the roles that I've had and the people I've worked under till this point in particular, I think you firstly it's nice to have goals and aims, but I think you can't lose sight of where you are right now, and you have to do a good job in the job that you're currently in. And if you do that, um, firstly you hopefully stay in a job because you know full time football jobs are very difficult, especially at this current moment in time. Yep. Uh, and then secondly you know, you may get opportunities elsewhere. And then I think it's up to you as to whether or not you choose to take that opportunity. And there's, there's a lot of 
you know, there are a lot of jobs that do become available um, and can seem quite attractive, but I think it's about taking the right job as, as much as you can be right at times, rather than maybe the first job, despite how attractive it may be, because coaching's a, a cruel world and, uh, you know, if you jump too early or you realize, you, you probably realise you're not where you need to be before making that jump, it's that balance between challenge and heading into what could be failures. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know where I'm going to end up. Uh, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't know where I was going to end up up until this point. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep trying to add some value into what, what happened here in Melbourne uh, last year. And if I can do that, um, yeah, we'll see where things go. But for, for now, I'm the assistant coach in the, uh, in the A-League and I'm very much looking forward to supporting PK and his head coach. Excellent. Cool. Uh, there's look, you know, you've uh, been to Europe, uh, you've you've coached in Australia, you've coached in NZ, and you would have seen some talents along the way. You you also mentioned a couple of the talents that moved from MPL to A League. Um, you know, what's your what's your thoughts on on the talents here in Australia? Um, you know, do you reckon they're capable of playing in Europe? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I do. I, I honestly do. And I think we've started to see that. I think Europe and other places in the world are starting to actually pay attention to what's going on down here now. And I think that's reflected, you know, I can say New Zealand, Sapreet Singh and Libya Kakache's move into Europe. Um, Daniel Azdani, you know, of course, went across mm -hmm. last year. George Blackwood's just gone to Oldham. Sam Silvera's gone into Portugal. Matt Miller to Shrewsbury. Lachlan Brooks gone to Brentford. And Ryan McGree's currently on loan at Birmingham. So, the young players are starting to get those opportunities maybe that once weren't there. And that's because clubs are looking and also because they've got that platform to showcase that they can play. And that A-League has been that platform for, for them at the at this current time. Yeah. And then you look further afield and you look at the Socceroos and they've been doing that for years. You know, they've shown that players from the side of the world can certainly um, not only go and uh, try and secure a squad space, but you've got players like Matty Ryan at Brighton and Aaron Moy who have consistently played now in the Premier League so one of the top leagues if not the top league in the world and yeah. then there's players like Bailey Wright and Harry Suter that are currently doing that as well as others so yes can they compete in Europe absolutely um, I think what people are I go back to people are now starting to really turn their attention not just to Europe but they're starting to look outside of Europe and yeah, hopefully the A-League is a definite um, opportunity to showcase their abilities and then it's about them going to, to try and challenge in that, in that space. But I certainly see they're capable of, of doing that. It's good to hear that. That would be good motivation for the upcoming players in Australia wanting to move to Europe. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Des, we want to say as well, uh, congratulations on winning the, uh, the New Zealand FA Men's Coach of the Year for 2020. Congrats. Uh, it's a great, great achievement. And um, I guess my question would be, uh, as a winner of such an award, how important do you think recognition is for young coaches or does it kind of fuel a bit of an ego trip in some, in some individuals? Yeah, well, thank you, firstly. Um, yeah, I think for me, it's more, it's more a recognition and it's a recognition of the tireless work of and commitment, sorry, of so many other staff and players yeah. Uh, who contributed towards building something from the ground up. There was so much work that went on. And generally, people don't see that work. You know, you, I think you're the head coach and, you know, things don't go right, you get sacked. And <laughs> if things go well, you get, the, um, you get the award or you get that. And, and without the support and the buy-in of so many people, uh, you don't get anywhere. Um, so for me, I go back to what I said around my coaching style, that collective ability for people to work together. Um, that's generally what is seen on the world stage or on a game. Um, but the people that are involved in those things really help enhance and get these awards. And that, that for me is a, a recognition of the hard work that goes in, not necessarily me as a head coach. So does it get people carried away? I'd like to, to think not. Um, I it might say you're on the right lines, but again, I, I don't think you can ever claim that as an individual award uh, without being respectful and obviously giving it to, to everyone else that's helped along that journey. You're definitely a humble person. <laughs> um, there's, there's just um, your departure from the, the NZ under 23s um, caught a lot of people off guard, um, seeing as you did well with them. Uh, why did you move on from the role? <laughs> yeah, I was made redundant. 
<laughs> yeah, it's. Um, I was I was contracted through until the end of the Olympics, which was supposed to be uh, in this year. And of course, we qualified uh, last back end of last year, and we were we become the most dominant team to ever uh, go to, to a qualification tournament and, and qualify uh, for a men's tournament. So we'd had some huge success, and we managed to continue on the playing style and the the culture work that we've done both on and off the field at that tournament. So. Mm. Yeah, I mean, when COVID hit, there were some financial drawbacks. And unfortunately for me, my, my role was was part of that. So, yeah, redundancy. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was that was partly my reason. For, well, not partly. That was the reason, you know, I needed to obviously move into a, another coaching job. And there wasn't one in New Zealand that uh, was, was possible. So it was a case of looking around uh, the world. And, again, there was opportunities to go into certain jobs. But I go back to what I said earlier. It's... Not necessarily about jumping at the first one or the second one. It's about looking for the right one, and I think I've I've certainly found that with uh, Melbourne City. Good stuff. Um, and touching on Melbourne City, of course, uh, you recently joined them as an assistant coach, as you mentioned. Um, what are your thoughts on the club so far, and and the personnel uh, around the place? Yeah, so my second week, uh, so we had a week, um, had a weekend with just the staff and now we had the first week last week, so last Monday with the players coming back in. So I still feel like a, a kid on a first school where you're still trying to strike up those relationships with people again. So talk, about, talk about being uh, uncomfortable, being comfortable, being uncomfortable. I'm yeah. currently in that stage. Yeah. But in terms of the club, you know, it's an, ex, it's an excellent club. A very well-run club. They had a great season last year. Um, I think, like you said, about making the right choice. I think with the personnel and the overall setup, players, uh, the ambitions of the, of the club, it was a really good fit for kind of where I was and, and where I where I am now. So, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the coming season and trying to add some value into to the excellent work that they did last year as a collective. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Des, if uh, anyone. Ill that's, you know, wants to follow your footsteps in becoming a professional coach, uh, what advice can you give them? <laughs> yeah. um, probably gain as much experience as possible uh, and recognise that there's probably more, not probably, there is, there's more than one way of doing things. And I think that's what makes football in particular so exciting. Um, there is no golden ticket, whether that be through player development or whether that be through winning games of football at any level. So gain as much experience and be as open-minded as possible. Recognise the different ways that you can do things and then look at how you might adapt that to suit you. Um, so not so much copying, but uh, certainly looking and, and seeing what, what you could take on your journey. So that would be the first. Um, second would be, I've already mentioned it twice through this, become comfortable being uncomfortable because... <laughs> For sure. It is, it is a very, it gives you some extremely good highs working in football, but there are some really uh, real deep lows and, and, you know, like losing out on the opportunity to go to Olympic Games as an example. That's a really uh, disappointing um, part of a, a career that, you know, I look back on and um, maybe and hopefully get the opportunity to do again at some point in my life. But mm -hmm. it has become comfortable being uncomfortable because the moment you're comfortable, you're, you're not challenging yourself and you're kind of standing still. I think with so many people now trying to um, learn and, and put themselves forward for these types of positions, that's a huge part of, of that. So, yeah, get used to that. And then <laughs> the, the final one is don't be in a rush. Yeah, don't be in a rush. I think there's a lot of coaches that see the... Um, the senior space as a uh, as the sort of the pinnacle of a, of a coaching journey and ideally a, pin, a head coaching role in the professional senior space as the the end outcome um, and I think sometimes you can be in a rush to get to somewhere and maybe not have the tools that you, you need to, to be successful and maybe do the job as well as you could do and that's where taking the time to understand you know, yourself, get to know yourself. I think taking the time to understand the culture and the environment, you know, especially if you're gonna work in different countries, what that is and what that means. Yeah. Um, and then I think, yeah, looking at being honest with yourself, what is it that you do need? And whether that's, again, good using mentors or, um, you know, I think generally most people understand some of their strengths and weaknesses and then trying to address them and work on them because yeah. when you do get that opportunity to go into a you know, top job, if that's a senior space, um, 
you will be tested and you won't have all the tools uh, but if you can position yourself in a way that you've you've done as much as you can up until that point and you think it's the right time for you to go in again until you go in you don't know um, but you try and prepare yourself as well as you can so yeah don't be in a rush and then also recognize where you're where you're really good at and this is something that somebody shared with me once was uh, although the attraction and the sexy part i suppose can be seen as being in the senior professional space yeah you may be the best under 14s coach in the country you know yeah. your characteristics your values the way you work with players and people you may be the best under 14s coach so you might find your niche and i think what we're starting to see in the world of football now is that those full-time positions at youth level uh, weren't necessarily there 10 years ago but i think we're starting to see an involvement of that where that can now be a profession for people at certain age groups so it's not all about getting to the senior space sometimes and i know that's again i'll go back to being the sexy part but i'll tell you what there's some really good coaches that i've worked with that are excellent at both junior levels and youth levels and they stay there because they recognize how well they they can relate to the people they work with and have the benefit of those players so they're just probably the three things for me i'm sure there's many more but um yeah they'd be the three that jump out to me straight away cool excellent well des thank you very very much for your time today uh, we all wish you the very best for the 2021 season and your coaching journey going forward and we'll definitely be uh be following you uh in your in your journey ahead and uh, hopefully bigger bigger much bigger and better things out there for you um and we we'll, would love to have you back on the podcast at any time no thank you for having me on it's uh, great to meet the two of you and again yeah, please keep in touch and if there's anything i can do just always reach out excellent thank you thank, thank you us. very much Guys, thank you again for joining us. If you would like this video, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing to our channel as we'll be bringing you more content like this in the near future. Until next time, stay safe and enjoy your football.